Let me start off with the protocol. Rotary International President Gordon McNeely, Rotary International Representatives, fellow Rotarians, Rotary actors, and interactors, protocol is observed. Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a great day. Thank you for joining us today for this pre-COP28 webinar. As we stand on the cusp of another pivotal moment in global climate change, today's discussion aims to inform, inspire, and catalyze collective efforts towards a sustainable future. I'm thrilled to be your moderator tonight in the UAE. I'm confident our discussions yeah. will be enriched by our esteemed panelists. I'm looking forward to hearing everyone's perspective and experiences and to, and to engaging you all in meaningful dialogue. Let's make this a pre-COP28 webinar to remember. Just to go through the agenda, this is the agenda for our evening. We will be talking about the history of Rotary at the beginning, RRN, Polio, and the Gavi. And then moving forward, we'll be talking about UNFCC, an additional C should be there, and Rotary, mental health, then well-being, then water supply, sanitation, and hygiene, and then moving to finance and clean energy, then afterwards gender equality, then we will talk about Rotaract at COP28, youth agenda, circular economy and industry, adopt the river, biodiversity watersheds and mangroves, and then biodiversity crisis, insects collapse, and photosynthesis collapse, and then finally agriculture and innovation. For just the rules of this webinar, all video and microphones for participants, as Maggie has mentioned earlier, will be muted during the webinar. Only the microphones and the videos for our panelists and myself will be on in order to avoid any background noise. Please ensure that your name on the Zoom webinar is in the following format, your name, your first name, your family name, plus the Rotary or Rotaract position, and then the country, as you can see with my current name. Utilize the Q&A, and this is for our uh, attendees to ask questions, but please keep it relevant questions and don't use it in order to spam. And these questions will be answered towards the end of the session. We request the panelists to keep an eye on the questions and uh, questions in order to answer them towards the end, since they might be relevant to your particular topic. This is me. I'm the Vice District Rotary representative here in the UE for this Rotary year, 2023-24. It is my privilege now to introduce a key voice in today's discourse, a woman dedicated to humanitarian and global health missions beyond professional success with Judith DeMont, be, uh, began with an award-winning PR consultancy, but, uh, but her advocacy in Rotary International and the fight against polio has made her a global figure. She was an integral part to 2021 Rotary delegation to COP26 and has been recognized for her work by figures ranging from the UK Parliament to the late Majesty Queen Elizabeth herself. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to the outstanding Ms. Judith DeMont. Thank you, Ramsey, um, for that introduction. Rotarians and guests around the world, a warm welcome to this webinar, and a special welcome to Rotary President Gordon McAnally and Paul DeSanka from UNFCCC. Thank you for joining us today. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said recently, the era of global warming has ended, and we now face the era of global boiling and climate chaos. Climate change impacts our rights to life, housing, health, water, and sanitation. Climate change is threatening the life and safety of billions of people and threatens global food production, including agriculture, transport, and infrastructure. And that is why we are here today. Rotary International recognized this crisis in 2020 when they introduced the environment as Rotary's seventh area of focus. And this has led to Rotary's involvement with the UN COP conferences. But I'd like to spend a few minutes highlighting the relationship of Rotary with the UN. Many of you may know that Rotary and the United Nations share a history of working together toward world understanding and peace. In 1942, Rotary Clubs from 21 Nations organized a conference in London, which resulted in the formation of UNESCO. 
1945, 49 Rotarians and 29 country delegations helped to draft the UN Charter in San Francisco. Rotary became heavily engaged in supporting the United Nations during the initial years. Indeed, five Rotarians served as presidents of the UN General Assembly. But it wasn't until the development of the Polio Plus program in the mid-1980s, working with its UN partners, WHO and UNICEF, that Rotary strengthened the liaison with the UN system. Recognizing the importance of this partnership, in 1991, the Rotary International Board approved a focus on the UN and international organizations as a target for high-level public relations. And hence, the Rotary representative network to the UN and international agencies was born. And so today, we have representatives in the UN in New York, the World Bank and Organization of American States in Washington, DC, in the European Union in Brussels, the FAO in Rome, Commonwealth in London, the Arab League in Cairo, UN Nairobi, UNEP and UNICEF, UN Santiago, Asian Development Bank in Manila, the African Development Bank in Djibouti, and the African Union in Addis Ababa. Rotary representatives are selected by and report to the RI president. Since July 2020, I've had the privilege of meeting the representatives as the dean, having previously served as Rotary's representative to the Commonwealth of Nations. Today, with top consultative status and experienced volunteer representatives of all these agencies, Rotary remains one of the most respected non-governmental organizations in the UN system. And today we have 30 volunteers appointed by the president, now representing Rotary at 22 UN agencies and international organizations in 12 capital cities around the world. And over many years, Rotary representatives have organized many Rotary events at these UN agencies, utilizing our contacts and professional skills. With Rotary introducing an area of focus on the environment, we naturally turned our attention to the COP conferences. The COP conferences are the UN's largest annual event. So what is COP? Well, COP is the United Nations Conference of the Parties, and it's a group of nations that have signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. It is the supreme decision-making body of the International Convention. And COP conferences have been held annually since 1995. Rotary International first participated in COP26 in Glasgow in 21. This meeting, we focused on nature-based solutions, and in particular, the importance of mangroves. And following COP26, more than 30 mangrove projects have been initiated in 26 countries. In 2022, a Rotary delegation attended COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, and this featured a variety of projects as well as the work of Rotary in Egypt. And the 28th edition is COP28, which will take place from the 30th of November to the 12th of December at Expo City, Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates. As the world's highest decision making process on climate issues, world leaders will gather to work together on solutions. COP28 will be based around four pillars, fast-tracking the energy transition, fixing climate finance, focusing on people, and making inclusivity a hallmark of the summit in Dubai. It is expected to host over 70,000 delegates, including heads of state and world leaders, to build consensus and facilitate progress on climate action among 198 countries, the European Union, and thousands of non-government organizations, companies, academia, and youth groups. Rotary's involvement in COP28 goes beyond environmental concerns, as it emphasizes the importance of empowering local communities to take action and play their part in building a greener, more resilient future. We know that there isn't a facet of humanity that climate change doesn't affect due to its immense impact on our communities. 
By fostering partnership with governments, NGOs, and other organizations, Rotary continues to demonstrate its dedication to creating a lasting impact on climate, climate action at COP28 in the UAE. And for the first time, we will have a pavilion and we plan to run 28 breakout sessions on the UN thematic days, including health, gender, youth, finance, energy transition, wash, peace, urbanization, transport, cities, and more. We are working in partnership with various NGOs, professional associations, and academia, including the CSR Foundation, Garvey, the Global Vaccine Alliance, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, the Institution of Engineering and Technology, the Global Diversity Alliance, which is the Kew Gardens Zoological Society and Natural History Museum in London, as well, of course, with Rotarians, Rotary Clubs and Districts. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for their wonderful support for us being at COP28. It will certainly bring Rotary to new audiences, develop new partnerships, and create hope that we can make a difference to the climate chaos. So what do we hope to achieve? Well, firstly, high level engagement of the Rotary International President and Chair of Trustees of the Rotary Foundation, with government ministers and heads of NGOs and business to further Rotary's aims. Also strengthening relations with delegates from the UN and UN agencies and others to help develop meaningful partnerships and projects. Creating opportunities for action by developing environment service projects with our partners. And most importantly, giving young people a voice, working with rotor actors from around the world. And finally, but most importantly, to give the Association of Rotary Clubs in the UAE a platform to create awareness and opportunities for service projects. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all our Rotary colleagues in the UAE for their wonderful support in the planning for COP28. And it now gives me great pleasure to invite Rotarian Paul de Semper, manager of the United Nations Climate Change Secretariat in Bonn, to address us. Paul. Thank you very much, and fellow thank Rotarians. The Conference of the Parties is, is the major climate event of the year, as we all know, and uh, it brings together state actors as well as non-state actors uh, to advance international policy on climate change and actions on the ground. Governments finalize negotiations on important policy aspects that have been going on throughout the year uh, through smaller meetings. Um, in June, we have a two-week session in Bonn where the technical aspects of the uh, negotiations are taking place, uh, as well as a number of regional events. Uh, and there is a major uh, climate week coming up in the MENA region that might be of interest uh, to, to the audience here. Uh, but but all of these events uh, sort of build up to uh, to the COP as as a way to finalize agreements and then advance on on implementing the convention and the Paris Agreement. Uh, during this particular COP, there are a number of uh, important aspects on the agenda. Uh, I will talk about two of these. Uh, the first is the global stock take, uh, where parties are sort of finalizing an assessment of how well. Uh, countries have been implementing the Paris Agreement in terms of emission reductions. Uh, some early reports point to the need for much greater ambition and, and uh, progress in this area. So we look forward to uh, this COP, I think, to, to dramatically scale up ambition in terms of emission reductions. Uh, the other that I'm involved with is the issue of loss and damage to, to the impacts of climate change. And in Sharm El Sheikh, uh, a new fund was created to, to help vulnerable countries and communities uh, respond to, to loss and damage. And, and this fund will be further operationalized at the next COP. And, and this is perhaps one of the other more important outcomes that's expected. Um, the COP attracts uh, highest levels of representation, including heads of state and so forth. So we were quite pleased to actually uh, know that the president of Rotary will be in attendance uh, along with uh, uh, various other delegates. And, and this is an opportunity perhaps to, to further engage with, with, with other players and actors. Uh, 
climate change is designed, as I said earlier, during the various meetings throughout the year. And, and, and there is an opportunity, I think, for Rotary to engage broadly and throughout the year. And I hope that uh, as Rotary starts to, to engage more fully in the convention activities, this would be the case. And then there will be uh, delegations going to the various meetings throughout the year and contributing in various ways. Uh, we cover everything from gender, indigenous people issues, uh, sectoral issues to do with water, food, uh, nature-based solutions, etc. So, so there is no lack of entry points for, for Rotary to get engaged. Um, the major communities of, of, of non-state actors are perhaps best uh, uh, aggregated through activities such as the Rest to Resilience, which is a, a community of, of practice of, of non-state actors working on adaptation and loss and damage. Uh, there, is, there is a similar community called Rest to Zero, which is all the actors playing on mitigation actions. And these are championed by, by two high level climate champions representing uh, the two presidencies. So the, the current president of the COP and the incoming president. So these are opportunities, I think, for, for our Rotary president perhaps to, to interact and, and meet with these two individuals to, to further strengthen the relationship. One of the important aspects to, to fully implementing the convention is, is perhaps the issue of, of mindset change that's required uh, for everybody to embrace uh, new ways of living. And, and I think there's no better example of doing this than through Rotary, given the nature of uh, Rotary clubs and membership and how we work as, as local clubs and interact with each other across disciplines and so forth. So I hope that the spirit of Rotary will penetrate through uh, all the other uh, interactions and discussions that take place over time. We have a number of Rotarians in the UNFCCC. Uh, I myself, I personally work on issues of adaptation and loss and damage but I have colleagues that work in other divisions that help support the whole process. So we stand ready to, to work with you and support you. I know the efforts that uh, you're likely to, to wish to participate in. Um, so in closing, uh, the COP is quite a complex maze of many events, but, but I hope that this would be the beginnings of, of, of a very active engagement of Rotary in the various activities. And over time, uh, Rotary will start to, to become recognized as a key player at the local level in particular. There is a lot of focus on locally led uh, actions. And I think Rotary is, a, is an extremely important example of, of how to do that. So we look forward to supporting you uh, and welcoming you uh, to, to Dubai at the COP. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, it's wonderful to have you here today, and we look forward to seeing you um, in Dubai. Um, we're delighted that our delegation to Dubai is going to be led by our international president, as Paul mentioned, Gordon McNally, and he's going to be accompanied by the chair of the trustees of the Rotary Foundation, Barry Russin, and also our general secretary, John Huco, will also be attending. So we've got a really strong delegation heading up our, um, our COP28 activities. And it now gives me great pleasure um, uh, to introduce a video from Gordon McAnally. Unfortunately, he is um, traveling today. As you know, he's traveling all around the world all the time. And today he's on a flight, as is Barry Rassin. And um, so he's not being here. He's also flying to Evanston today. And um, the other person I'd like to mention, who's um, in the lead delegation, um, is Mohamed Delawa, our Rotary representative to the Arab League based in Cairo. And um, he's been very supportive in, in the planning with the Dubai Rotarians um, for COP28. Um, and also Mohamed is traveling today and unfortunately can't be with us. Um, so I'd now like to introduce a video um, with a message from Rotary International President Gordon McNally. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this important topic. I will be participating in a discussion about mental health and the environment in Dubai, and I'm delighted to offer a preview to you. The record global temperatures this year have underscored the immediate need to take action on climate change. And they have also demonstrated the massive destructive toll that climate is taking on global mental health. We are already facing a global mental health crisis in the post-pandemic world, and climate change issues are exacerbating the situation. It's been well established by numerous studies that extreme heat, as we witnessed in much of the Northern Hemisphere this summer, leads to greater rates of violence and incidents of mental distress. 
Disasters caused by climate change are also leading to an explosion in demand for trauma-informed mental health care, not only for the people suffering through hurricanes, droughts, floods, frequent power failures and other climate-related issues, but also for the disaster relief workers who are helping distressed people deal with these situations. Rotary's partner Shelterbox, for example, is placing an increasingly large part of their disaster response effort into this kind of trauma-related care. And the increased frequency of climate disasters is making it essential to include mental health services into community recovery efforts. There is also an increasing body of evidence that gradual long-term effects of climate change are contributing to mood and anxiety disorders, to schizophrenia, to dementia, and to suicide rates. All of these concerns need greater focus from healthcare professionals and more support from governments and civil society. But perhaps the greatest immediate concern involving climate change and mental health is the eco-anxiety that is rising rapidly among young people worldwide. A 2021 global survey of people 16 to 25 found that 84% of respondents were at least moderately worried about climate change. That same study found that more than 50% reported having feelings of sadness, anxiety, anger, powerlessness, helplessness, and guilt. More than 45% of respondents reported that their feelings about climate change had a negative impact on their daily life and functioning. And 75%, three out of every four, said they were frightened for the future. This is an area where we can take immediate decisive action to change the narrative and replace gloom with hope. We must stand up for young people worldwide and declare that while the climate crisis is caused by human beings, it can also be solved by human beings. We have the capacity to act and create hope in the world right now. Better mental health care for people dealing with climate change and worried about climate change is great. But action to lessen future impacts and catastrophes and to demonstrate to young people that we can take responsibility for the planet is even better. Rotary is committed to taking action to protect our environment. It is one of our areas of focus as an organisation, and we are deeply committed to all aspects of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Together, we can and must act now to protect the planet and replace gloom with optimism, demonstrating that determination, resilience and cooperation can change the world and point us towards a brighter future. I look forward to seeing many of you in Dubai in December. And with that, I would like to hand over to Rose. We will be moving to the Rotary International Representative to UNICEF, Ms. Rose Cadrelli. Uh, I'll be sharing the, you will be sharing your presentation, correct? Yes, that's correct. Perfect. Thank you so much. So good morning. Good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I'd first like to thank um, the leadership of this planning committee for allowing me to be a part of this very important event. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So I have a slideshow for you with lots of slides, but I promise to go through them rather quickly since you've heard most of this from Judith. So this is a little bit about me. I'm the Rotary International Representative to UNICEF USA. I'm also the founder and CEO of the Education for All Coalition, where we provide educational resources to displaced children, mostly in refugee camps. I'm associated with many different UN organizations. I've had the privilege of working with them um, and also with educational organizations around the world. I am a former professor of human security at the National Defense University, and I'm a former U.S. Army Medical Service Corps officer, where I commanded many medical units over several decades. Now, I'm giving you a little bit of background, um, and, and I know that we don't need that as we have experts in the audience, but we know that climate change is our greatest threat. 
And not only does it destabilize societies and affects our physical, mental health and more, uh, it has an, the opportunity to affect or impact diseases, the infrastructures that we use for facilities and our health worker capacity. Now, in, in a greater perspective, this also has the potential of affecting economic security, food and water insecurities, educational systems, and more. The purpose of our particular sessions will be to inform a glo global audience about what we need to do to address physical and mental health, to look at um, the impact that education, innovation, and empowerment can have on some of these decisions to mitigate climate issues and to develop policies and figure out where we need to make those investments. And then to emphasize the importance of collaboration, which is what we're doing today and what we will do at COP28. We will have a group of 51 rotor, uh, rotary, uh, rotary individuals as well as rotaractors. Uh, I throw this up here for my benefit because when we talk about our spaces that we'll, we'll be using, we'll be in the pavilion and the arena in the blue zone. And that will give us capacity to reach out to large numbers of individuals during our sessions. Our tracks include health, relief, recovery, peace, finance, trade, gender, equity, accountability, energy, industry, transition, indigenous personnel, multi-level action, urban and, and built environment, and transportation. Almost all the topics that are important to us. Now, in the first week, there will be some uh, highlights. On 3 December, of course, we're going to talk about climate, health, and wellness. Uh, this gives you kind of a breakdown of what's going to occur on that first week. We'll also talk about gender, finance systems, and trade. We'll have a gala dinner hosted by the Association of Rotary Clubs in the UAE, and we'll have a high-level reception. So a great opportunity for networking, collaboration, and, and just meeting others that have the same passions that we have. In my session for health and wellness, that will, that will occur on Monday, the 4th of December, the concept is to bring together health professionals and experts from Rotary and other organizations. We have confirmed that Dr. Vanessa Carey, the uh, WHO Director for the General Special Envoy for Climate Change and Health has been confirmed. She's very excited to be with us. And so that's going to be a very interesting talk, I'm sure. And then we've confirmed with Gavi that we'll have Anna Marie Baje, and she's been confirmed. And Nicole Brown is the Director of Global Cause Partnership. She is going to tell us who the most important person in UNICEF is to join us. And then we'll have a question and answer period. The next session will, will be about mental health. This will be on Tuesday, 5 December. What's really unique about this particular session is our president, uh, Gordon McAnally, will will actually lead this conversation. We'll interview him. We'll talk to him about his thoughts and his perspectives. He has a personal passion for this particular topic. And we also have Dr. Campbell Lendrum from the WHO who will be a part of that particular session. They're gonna focus on mental health and the effects of climate threats. Uh, we are privileged to have partnerships from the Global SER. Um, they will be, that's the um, um, uh, Corporate Social Responsibility Organization based out of Chicago, Illinois. And they're going to talk to us about um, health of women and girl, the girl child, green sustainable finance, and have a youth panel on climate advocacy, working with road reactors. Oh, and I just had to throw this little plug in. My book has been approved. It's about children and climate, the climate migration crisis. My focal point is that I think even though we have children that have been displaced because of war, conflict, and other issues, uh, we need to start recognizing the fact that there are many children that are displaced because of climate. And this will have a great impact. And so um, uh, this will be published in uh, March of 2024, but I'm very pleased to say that it is a book about the issues, about policy, about framework, and what we need to do to focus on children that are affected by climate migration. Thank you so much, uh, Rose, for that very informative session. We will now be moving towards the co-founder and country director uh, of the high IT, uh, IT outreach, Mr. Neil uh, Van Dyne. You have a presentation to be sharing, or will you? Uh, I'll just be speaking. A presentation. No problem. No problem. Thank you. 
Great, thank you very much. And uh, welcome everyone. I'm uh, Neil Van Dyne. I'm the media past chair of the WASH Rotary Action Group uh, and a board member of the Handwash Initiative in Haiti. So I'm excited to be here today and talk to you about the session 3-2, December 3rd, the second session following ROSES, uh, which will Im immediately impact relief and recovery. So after a couple of sessions, high level sessions, we have a, a few more practical aspects. We're excited to uh, have the potential, the Minister of Environment of Haiti be speaking on the National Adaptation and, and Climate Change Plan of the country of Haiti, uh, where the minister is putting in place policies designed in tandem with not only the multiple ministries of the Haitian government and UN agencies, but also civil sector uh, civil sector integration. So they're focused on uh, promoting reforestation, restoration of soil and biodiversity on a national level with their aspiration to make Haiti more resilient and progressively restore the environment. Uh, we'll also have a speech from uh, Ryan Rowe, the executive director of Handwash, who has worked uh, with Rotarians across Haiti and from around the world to build resilient systems that are better prepared and can rapidly adapt to the needs and situations uh, that are unique to Haiti. From designing and building disaster resilient infrastructure, uh, ensuring strong local ownership, creating management structures uh, that are capable of adapting to relief and recovery scenarios, Handwash is really providing means for Rotarians to participate and meaningfully engage the local citizens and local leaders in strengthening their country. The third session there will be on uh, a proposal for safe drinking water for 2 billion people. How do we get safe drinking water through household water filtration uh, and market-based solutions? While many people are buying household water filters in the developed world, and it's a multi-million dollar business, how do we get household water treatment to uh, individual households in a broader context? So this household water treatment plan is independent of climate change, and it's really an intermediate option in a recovery scenario to reach the goal of safe water for all. Our second session will be on December 10th, uh, session two on December 10th, and it's primarily based on food, agriculture, and water. So uh, there we have an exciting speaker in the form of uh, Angela Tenbrock, who has done fantastic work in regenerative agriculture and aquaponics. Uh, she's uh, created a revolutionary approach to farming that merges soil enrichment practices with climate smart controlled environments. And this innovative method, and tr it's reimagining traditional farming, addressing environmental concerns and regenerating the soil and providing food security. So uh, we also have Peter Juna from uh, the CEO of Kickstart that works with small landholder irrigation in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, they produce low-cost irrigation pumps and found a way to move over a million people out of poverty through small-scale irrigation. Uh, there will be shortly multiple billions of people in Sub-Saharan Africa, and their solution provides a way for expanding irrigation farming and uh, empowering women and youth. On top of that, we'll have Hank Holstead from the Smart Center Group presenting on deep bed farming and smart water solutions. These are local and low cost options to adopt, adapt to climate change in Africa and help promote the goal of the SDGs for food, gender, water, and work. We're really excited about those uh, policies. Uh, thirdly, we'll have Ryan Rowe again speaking on Rotary civil society engagement and transformation the con transforming the conversation in WASH services. And really by engaging the ha citizens of Haiti directly with Rotarians acting as key influencers, how they're building relationships with local government and enabling them to work together and de deliver basic public services in a context where the government is largely eroded. Uh, by doing this, Handwash is creating communities and collaborative, collaborative solutions, increasing opportunities for citizens, and we believe that this is really planting the seeds for not only more sustainable water sanitation and hygiene services, 
but introducing a more peaceful Haitian society. So I encourage everyone to attend these two sessions. We're really excited about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil, for that. Appreciate that. And uh, for now, we're going to be moving towards the president of the Association of Rotary Clubs here in the UAE, President uh, Yassin Jafar. Uh, president Yassin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ramzi. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> it's very interesting, all this presentation with very valuable information that we all pour into the environment and into the goals and the objectives of uh, the Rotary. Uh, this is something uh, happening extraordinary this year in the UAE, which is the COP28. We are delighted that Rotary International has finally uh, achieved the goal of having its uh, stand, and we're working together to make sure that uh, this will be a great success for Rotary for many years to come and becomes hopefully as part of the CUP uh, conferences in other countries. My, title, my uh, presentation is about finance and environment and the environment and the climate, as Judith said at the very beginning of the se sessions, is uh, the climate is now went beyond and it's boiling now. And you could see what has happened recently in number of countries in the Mediterranean, like Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, recently in Libya, uh, and, re and and very recent in certain parts of Egypt. So that's caused uh, a, a huge problems in terms of uh, the damage to the environment, the damage to the ground, the damage to the food, the damage to houses, human, children, women, uh, which could raise a number of challenges in the future. Uh, Rotary for 20 years has been trying to fight and has been fighting and successfully winning the polio. And in these areas, uh, there's a great possibility polio will come back into these areas. I think Rotary will do its uh, normal um, duties in these areas, but uh, this is uh, this brings the environment as a major topic and and everything. And I'm going to give a couple of examples of how we are in, in line with uh, COP28 and going forward in the future. Going to try as Rotary to participate in this. Uh, <clears throat> The finance is a major part of resolving any project. The finance is a major factor in resolving problem. So the example number one we have uh, in my role as the president of UAE Association, which all the clubs report to, or uh, uh, it's the holding for all the clubs, the, we are practicing something in new here, which is called corporate tax. We've been living in a heaven for a very long time. I think we continue to live in this heaven, but we're going to have a 9% corporate tax. We're trying to register the association that can benefit from that corporate tax, and it could be donation to Rotary as a tax deduction, uh, from companies, a lot of companies like that idea. Uh, I chair a number of companies in the UAE and abroad, and I think uh, funneling the money uh, towards something really good, which is the environment and the causes of Rotary, I think it's uh, great. We are in the process of doing that now. It's not going to be easy. It's a new concept, but we are going to register Rotary uh, foundation in the UAE that can benefit from uh, tax uh, exemption uh, or using the CSR policies of these large corporation to donate to Rotary and Rotary can take this money and employ it into different projects, uh, mainly the environment and the children, women's and other uh, factors or the other pillars of Rotary. So we have uh, with the team, we have in the Rotary Association been working with a number of professionals as part of the Rotary members here 
There are a number of professionals who are in the audit firm and trying to approve the association as that one for the environmental uh, use. So <clears throat> what happened is if uh, we can approve this association to be a, a tax deduction, uh, this will be great. And this year in the UAE, they have the government brought something called sustainable fund. And sustainable fund will finance any projects that could approve its environmental benefits. I think uh, uh, we, uh, when I say we, mean some of the companies that uh, I work with has benefit from this fund and in water mainly, in mangroves mainly nowadays. And uh, I think this fund has been very, very active. I think the fund will continue and the government will put more money into it for that one. We are in the uh, Rotary UAE trying to utilize this fund. We're trying to utilize uh, the, the, the CSR uh, budgets, trying to encourage people to donate for us will be tax deductible. So there's a number of uh, points we're taking care of here and that will create finance for us. We're making a list of specific actually projects now and working alongside with the government in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Sharjah. We have done in the past, but we will continue and do it maybe on a larger scale. Recently, the CO2 become a huge problem in the environment. I see the UK Prime Minister a month ago announced a very large budget for Scotland for the CO2 CO capture. UAE has done the same. I have been part of the Abu Dhabi Petroleum Show, which is an annual show for the last 30 years. They have announced a very large budget for CO2, and this is going to continue. So all these companies will make a lot of money we are going to approach them and we maybe will create our own fund for people to donate to that fund because it will be all tax deductible and use the sustainable fund. What I would suggest at the end of my uh, short presentation is uh, Rotary has been always very successful in projects on a global basis. I will take one example, end polio uh, scheme or end polio uh, uh, program. If we can, uh, if Rotary can adopt uh, uh, a scheme or a, a program for the environmental to work with large international companies, we are working here with some European, US, Middle Eastern, very large companies. But I think if Rotary International on that scale make a lot of partnership, I think that fund could be filled very easily, especially that the tax uh, system in Europe and in US and other parts of the world is very matured and uh, there is a clearance on tax deductible thing. I would suggest at the end, I will summarize my suggestion that Rotary International should take the initiative of creating uh, an environmental fund in partnership with the large companies who specially participate in maybe the environment directly or indirectly. We're going to do this in the UAE. We could be used as the pilot project. We will be, can be used by uh, as, as uh, an example, if you guys like, but I think we have to do that. There will be small uh, presentation uh, on the 5th of uh, December when we host uh, the president and the team uh, in our gala dinner, and we will be exhibiting uh, in the foyer a uh, number of uh, companies who are environmentally uh, friendly companies who are helping to utilize this one, those who has participated. So there will be maybe 10 or 15 companies who will also donate money to that night uh, for the environment or for the foundation. But uh, we will start this process. We will start this fund. Myself, uh, Mr. Ahmed and Maggie, been working on this now, trying to get an approval to have this fund. This could be a pilot of projects for Rotary International. And Rotary International, with all the resources it has, especially the Rotarians who are in different levels in different parts of the world, in different organizations, have access to a lot of 
the rules, regulations, and have access to a lot of the money, I think can start that fund tremendously. We are going to start here, and hopefully we'll announce it during the COP28. We hope we have some sort of a degree from the government to proceed with that one. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, good luck. Thank you, President Yassin, and thank you for mentioning as well the General Manager of the Association of Rotary Clubs here in the UAE, Mr. Ahmed Bil Silah. Obviously, a lot of effort has been gone, going from him towards the uh, possibility of having the green, uh, sorry, the blue pavilion within within Expo 2020 or Expo City. For now, uh, we will be moving uh, towards Dr. Celine Chalik who is the founder of Women in Smart Energy UK, that will be talking to us about gender equality. The floor is yours, doctor. I welcome all Rotary family from London. I'm honored that Rotary will organize a session called Gender Equality during COP28. Uh, there is a one Chinese proverb. Uh, I just want to share this. I just want to start my speech with this. Uh, Teach a man to fish and he will eat for a lifetime. Teach a woman to fish, she will accuse of, of you of patronizing her and claim she have to do it anyway, that even if she didn't, she could easily work it out without the help of any person. So this session uh, during COP28 gender equality session will be, of course, to discuss to empower women in less fortunate areas uh, as uh, Dr. Yasin mentioned, in Afghanistan, in Libya, in Syria, in Pakistan, and also all around the world, including our amazing polio program, and so on and so forth. So we wouldn't prefer this session to turn into a battleground between men and women, as usual, of course. It will be a good exchange program and session. So who I am, uh, I'm Dr. Selim from Rotary Club of London, and I'm the founder of CEO, I'm the founder and CEO of Women in Smart Energy NGO, uh, based in the UK. And I am as the first female author in the UK to publish a groundbreaking book. It's called Renaissance of Smart Energy. So my dedication to empowering women in the field of smart energy is truly uh, amazing and lifetime uh, dedication uh, so women are dispro disproportionately affected by uh, growing water scarcity and inadequate sanitation because of their specific hygiene needs and their role in collecting water in less fortunate areas so tackling discrimination and social norms in relation with water management would allow societies to leverage the role of women in better functioning water systems, wider access and inclusive economic benefits for communities. According to UN Welfare Report 2020, United Nations Welfare Report published in 2020, worldwide women and girls spend an estimated 200 million hours daily collecting water. It is not monthly or it's not yearly, it is daily, 200 million hours collecting water. So this is a gigantic waste of valuable time. Uh, let's say, just imagine, uh, I just want to just draw a picture in your mind. Just imagine those 200 million hours add up to 8.3 million days or more than 22,800 years. So... Uh, in a in a hypothetical scenario, it is as if a woman started to walk with her empty bucket in the Stone Age and didn't reach home with any water until now, 2023. So in that regard, in May 2019, Rotary Club proudly launched its comprehensive gen gender equality strategy within Global Polio Eradication Initiative as Judith, perf as Judith perfectly highlighted, to address gender-related barriers to immunization and significantly improve the representation of women at all levels of program. Since then, this program has made strides towards achieving the goals set out in this strategy. 
thanks to of course thanks to the tireless efforts of dedicated gender speci specialists at all level of this program and also government partners some donors and frontline workers in 2021 uh, this program uh, uh, formed as a gender mainstream group formed to provide guidance and enable information sharing and coordination among partners to advance gender equality uh, throughout all aspects of programming at any levels. So uh, in October 2020, 2022, after an independent midterm review, this polio oversight board approved the extension of gender equality strategy until 2026, as again, Judith extremely amazing uh, in a perfect way she highlighted. Uh, in the line with the project's broader strategy for the eradication. So uh, with respect to sustainable development goals, gender equality, it is the fifth one of 17 amazing sustainable development goals, SDGs, established by United Nations, as you know, in 2015. As a Rotary family, we believe that exemplifying and embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion, it is called DEI, as you know, should be a part of everything we do at Rotary. So related to that, this year at COP28 in Dubai, we are very proud to host a panel session on gender equality. By the help of this highly intellectual and sophisticated panel, Rotary aims to highlight the women's empowerment during COP28 in the energy sector, especially renewables, manual with concept ideas, projects and initiatives for decentralized renewable and gender just uh, gender focused solutions. So um, I just want to share one uh, small, actually uh, a brief uh, number about uh, women and the women and the energy industry workforce. According to the International Energy Agency, women only account for around 20, uh, approximately 22% uh, of the workforce in the energy industry. So progress has been made in recent years, but there is still much work to be done uh, according to, you know, combined uh, women and energy industry workforce. So, uh, relatedly, Rotary Club is committed to remaining an innovative and inclusive institution to work for diverse talents and backgrounds, the harmony of SCG 5 during COP28. So, I would like to take this opportunity to thank first Judith Diamond for her trust on my women empowerment projects and also Mr. Christopher Puttock. Who, fell, who I feel really, really uh, haven't been thanked enough for their support during this COP28 process. And looking forward to meeting you at COP28 in Dubai. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. And we are looking forward to meeting you as well, personally here in Dubai. Of course, thanks to everyone, uh, including also Chris, who is the program manager here also for the COP28. Um, and uh, now I'm going to be giving the floor to a close friend of mine and our past DRR of District 2452, uh, Maggie Poposka. I will be muting now and giving her the floor. Thank you, Maggie. Dear Rotarians, dear Rotaractors Protocol observed. As an advocate of youth, um, I would like to praise the Rotary International vision to elevate Rotaract and allow us to be part of the shaping of the new Rotarian future. At this COP28, we will be hosting 12 well-deserved international Rotaractors passionate in environmental causes from six different continents. The application deadline is over and we are happily informing you that we received more than 60 applications that will go to further revision in the next two weeks. They will be an official support at the pavilion and will help us also to brainstorm solutions and projects. The volunteers will also experience the UA hospitality with immersive touristic attractions and also work together with our Rotaract UA team and Rotaract District 2452. 
Similarly, UAE government who believes that youth it's uh, also should be always inclusive in everything that they shape for, for the prosperity and the development of this country. They've made the youth official delegates for the policy making for the first time at any COP. Proudly for that, I would also like to introduce to you our next speaker, Rim Al Musabeh, an Emirati multipreneur and advocate for youth empowerment and tech innovation and official Dubai Youth Council representative. Rim, the, the floor is yours. Hi, hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect, so first of all, uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be part of this. And I resonate with whatever my previous colleagues mentioned. Uh, as we know, the UAE is a global hub when it comes to logistics, transportation, green technology businesses, the country is uniquely positioned to build bridges and for foster inclusive climate progress. And in addition to this, COP28 also uh, provided a youth climate champion. They launched the International Youth Climate Delegates Program. It is the largest in initiative of its kind to empower young people from around the world to fully participate in COP uh, processes with a special focus from youth from least developed countries, which is a very important aspect with over 100 delegates selected and 36 are coming from African dissidents. This is a testament to the UAE's effort when it comes to youth engagement as part of the UAE efforts to exchange best practices on youth inclusion. In addition to this, I would like to share also some of my insights. So I was uh, privileged enough to get selected to attend the SDGs Action Weekend with amazing youth from all around the world and engage in thought-provoking decisions, collaborative sessions, and network with individuals. And I've learned something. It was truly amazing to see people from diverse backgrounds come together with a very common cause and to create a more sustainable uh, and equitable future for all. But the message was clear. Interconnected challenges demand interconnected solutions. And this is something that I would like everyone also to take note of. And these are my, uh, my prominent key takeaways that I would like to share with everyone. Despite us talking about various aspects, but the promise of system thinking, it goes beyond just merely addressing existing problems. It's the understanding of roots of these issues and recognizing their connections and developing long-term solutions. The second point is that we need to understand that youth are not just stakeholders, but they are shareholders when it comes to solving these problems. And I'm very much happy with the progress that UAE is making in terms of involving youth in decision maker making. Their involvement should not merely just be about participation, but about creating a space for very meaningful contribution, which is very important. And that's what we focus on. And lastly, global citizenship. The developed world role became more apparent. We need to support also other developing nations and provide a pathway for global advancement because prosperity in one region can bolster prosperity in another. I would like to take also this opportunity that COP28 in the UAE will unite everyone. It's not just another event, another conference from the government, but it's a very inclusive uh, platform where governments, businesses, civil society, youth, NGOs, IGOs, are all concentrated to drive an inclusive progress towards climate change. And I hope to see you all at COP28. Thank you. Thank you, Reem. Thank you for that. Very informative. And we look forward to seeing you as well at COP28. Thank you. We, we have uh, had Reem actually speak at multiple sessions, also during our district conference last year. Always a pleasure. Uh, now we are going to be moving towards a, a topic about circular economy, which will be provided by Mr. Yasser Atachik. Uh, if you don't mind just actually telling me how you say your last name, it will be great. Atachik? Atajik. Atajik. Thank you so much. Okay, so Mr. Uh, Yasser Atajik, the chair from Ezraq, will be talking to us about circular economy. The floor is yours, Mr. Yasser. Thank you. Thank you. I have a... a presentation and let me share it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good day, everybody. At COP, uh, the delegates, there will be lots of delegates and they will try to make various decisions on the 1.5 degree and on reaching the zero emissions by 2050. Earlier in the webinar, we heard Mr. 
Jaffer about the changes in some of the uh, financing and energy uh, production. Zero emission goals require changes in the industry and large scale financing for this transition. So at COP28, aligning with these teams, we have sessions on transition of the industry, circular economy, and the financing of this transition. Circular economy is a way of achieving both material and energy savings. To reach zero emissions, the industry must change. Its production systems and the industrial clim climate must adjust to the new future. Many countries have installed carbon taxes or carbon trading systems to decarbonize their emissions and reduce emissions. In this transition, European Union is leading the world in their legislation and impl implementation. So at the industry session at COP28, we will have uh, somebody from European Union and hear their approach and what they are aiming with the emission trading system and the carbon border adjustment system, which they have recently launched. We will have a second example from Canada. Further, some big carbon emitting industries like steel, cement, and aluminum must innovate and change their production systems. Cement production causes emissions of 0.5 to 0.7 kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilogram of cement. The chemical, chemical reaction to produce cement release carbon dioxide and just cement production is responsible for 8% of the carbon dioxide emissions. In this session, we will have the emission reduction plans from one of the largest producers, Holcim. They have a net zero emission target for 2050. According to the World Economic Forum, the cost of this zero emission transition is close to $50 trillion by 2050. Other estimates show the need for three to $5.8 trillion per year. And in 20, T09 at COP15, developed countries committed to a collective goal of mobilizing $100 billion per year by 2020. And that will be used for climate action in developing countries. Unfortunately, as of now, this did not materialize. Further, developing countries are in big debt. So this session will address these problems. Our speakers will discuss the solutions to this problem. And our speakers are Michael Mainelli, the new Lord Mayor of London, Mr. Yasin Jafar from Adunak, from United Arab Emirates that we listened a while ago, Avinash Persaud, an economist and special envoy to the Prime Minister of Barbados, and our final speaker will be Aditya Bahadur, who will speak about organizing funding as an NGO. Recently, another concern has been highlighted by the International Energy Agency and others, that of need to reduce energy consumption. This calls for changes in business model, product design, and energy efficiency improvements. On a related concern, material consumption is providing even faster than, is growing even faster than carbon emissions, which is putting a lot of pressure on some of the key raw materials. Circular economy is an answer to both of these problems. Netherlands is reported to be the leader in this area. In this session, we will hear about the Netherlands and Japan's approach to this issue. And a third speaker will speak about various 
circular economy projects undertaken by Rotary clubs around the world, from repair coffees to lithium ion battery recycling to circular design competitions. So that's what we are going to speak about at the COP28 in two, two months. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Ramzi. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Yasara. Thank you very much. I'm very interested actually in the circular economy and we'll be looking forward to hearing more about it in during the COP28. Uh, for now, we're going to be talking uh, and we're going to be listening actually to Mr. Salvador Rico, who is a promoter of the Adoptative Program, an Assistant Governor, International Service Chair, member of the team of cadres for the Rotary Foundation, a lot of different positions. We say it in Arabic, mashallah, that's uh, uh, by God's grace. So uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Salvador. Please talk to us about Adoptative. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ramsey. I really appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And uh, thank all of you that uh, helped us fundraise to be able to make this pavilion a COP28 a reality. Um, so one of the focuses at COP28 is nature-based solutions, which fits perfectly with the Rory Foundation's seventh area of focus, protecting the environment. The sessions that I'll be helping with at COP28 is energy transition, discussing energy transition, electrification, hydrogen use, electric hydrogen fuel cells, wind, solar. But the biggest thing is how can we bring it down to the Rotary Club level? And that's something that we're gonna be finding out at COP28. Other areas that we're gonna be helping with is also is about transportation, uh, land, sea, air, trains, inner cities, high-speed rails, cycling, alternative transportation, such electric bikes, scooters, converting public spaces to vehicle-free spaces, types of green vehicles used in transportation, et cetera. Again, how can we bring this down to our communities and how our Rotary Clubs can be engaged on that? Care for oceans, uh, pollution prevention, coral reef restorations, mangroves reforestation, and uh, one of the particular one that we're gonna be sharing over there at COP28 is the sinking of the ship global grant that uh, we helped uh, um, develop and it's about to become a reality. I just heard yesterday that uh, the government in Mexico has approved the sinking of the ship. They have already given us the date. So November 24th is when that artificial coral reef is gonna become a reality of this year. So by COP28, our positive governor, Kikis uh, Arvesu, will be sharing with us uh, over there in Dubai. So. Talk about the Adopt a River program and why is it so important? It's again, restoring, protecting the environment um, and uh, taking care of biodiversity. It's about water security. It's about clean water. Water pollution that are on the rivers affect us all, affects the biodiversity, affects the vegetation. Uh, water is being used from rivers to be able to uh, irrigate an agriculture, but a lot of the times, that water is already polluted. So guess what happens with the vegetation, with the vegetables that we eat, they are contaminated. So that is so important is the Adopt a River program is for you to engage for your club to sign up and be part of this. And uh, we'll be sharing about uh, the Adopt a Rivers uh, programs that have been done in different districts in India, in Mexico, in Guatemala, and other clubs that are already signing up to do this. Um, and also, to restore them in the ecosystems, reforestation projects, taking care of the upper watersheds on the rivers is extremely important to be able to maintain an all year round in the river flow. So if we don't have vegetation on the mountains, um, the water cannot be absorbed on the soil and thus automatically creates uh, a dry conditions. So in here, I'm gonna share a couple of slides um, so you can see on the little examples of what uh, some of the clubs are doing in Mexico and Guatemala, for instance. And in Guatemala, the, the Rotarians just last weekend signed up an agreement to be able to work on the Motagua River. Motagua River brings over 20,000 metric tons of plastic to the Caribbean, to the ocean. That affects everything all along the riverbank, 
but also on the ocean affects the, the coral reefs and it causes the loss of biodiversity affecting us all again. The other uh, projects that we're doing is in the upper watershed in the River Lerma, doing reforestation on the mountains, engaging with rotary clubs, with interact clubs, with rotary kids, teaching them to take care of the environment because what we do today is, is what we're gonna be leaving for them. Again, mention about the uh, sinking of the ship that is gonna happen on November 24th um, to create a new coral reef. This ship was a Navy ship, an instrument of war that will be turned in an instrument of peace. In an area where we're gonna be having a, a new uh, ecotourism and create a new biodiversity in the Sea of Cortez in Mexico. And again, about the Adopt a River program is a program that is all the way from the mountains to the sea. It's taking care of the biodiversity to be able to take care of us all. So thank you. Thank you so much, Salvador. Very nice presentation. And I look forward to hearing a lot more about it. Uh, for now, we're going to be moving towards our project, uh, a program manager for COP28, who is going to be talking to us about watersheds and mangroves, Mr. Cross Christopher Potok himself. The floor is yours, Mr. Chris. Thank you so much. Uh, as you know, my name is uh, Christopher Potok, and I'm under the leadership of Judith Ament. My role has been largely to coordinate the 28 or more breakout sessions and site events that we'll be having across the 12 days of COP. We only had two at Sharm el -Sheikh. So we have grown immensely. Um, through these sessions, we're showing you today what uh, we are working towards, a sustainable environment, removing pollution and addressing climate challenge that we have and where we want to work to eliminate, minimize and mitigate climate impacts. I have delegated so much of my team to do work, but uh, that doesn't leave me without a side event. And this one will be on the 9th of December in the Land, Use, Nature and Oceans Day. The session I'll be leading is within my area of expertise, uh, nature. The panel will include three presenters from the Biodiversity Alliance including the director of Kew Gardens, Richard Deverell. Um, this is the Alliance of Botanic Gardens, Zoological Gardens and uh, Natural History Museums. These organizations are particularly concerned with the loss of biodiversity around the world, especially due to the impact of uh, climate pushing ecosystems out of existence and our insatiable appetite for land which is shared by iconic animals out of existence also. There's also a misrepresentation of what nature-based solutions can do in our rapidly warming world, which leads to the question of what happens when it gets too hot that nature breaks down. Then one of my major concerns is the loss of the integrity of watersheds. So I'm deeply involved with a program that's Salvador has just mentioned, adopt a river and everything to do with watersheds. And I'll share this. I just want to share this. Can you share my screen? So I just want to talk a little bit about an organization that uh, we are working with. And uh, this is to do with our efforts to retain and clean water, uh, retain and have clean water in watersheds by building retention walls that hold back water in intermittent streams, stopping sedimentation and creating groundwater replenishment for months when the streams do not flow. This happens in many areas of the world uh, where there's only a short rainy season and uh, the rivers are then dry, these riverbeds are dry for the rest of the year, but the, they have groundwater underneath and these need to be replenished. These retaining walls help keep the water from running away as surface water to the sea. And these dams then enable villages to have livelihoods throughout the year. Uh, 
I hope you can see my next slide. Um, so the other area I'm really involved with is mangrove restoration for Rotary around the world. Mangrove ecosystems in the tropics and subtropics are imperiled by their position along coastlines because of the rapid sea level rise that we're experiencing, probably about 10 centimeters over every decade for the next century, and the persistent need for human coastal development and material resources, these ecosystems are being squeezed out of existence. Today, in developed countries, the majority of the remaining mangrove ecosystems are protected by government jurisdictions and legislation. Working with governments and local communities, Rotary has the unique opportunity to assist communities in mangrove restoration projects. As you've already heard, uh, Shaker Meta announced that we would be working with mangrove projects uh, from Glasgow 2026, and he tapped me to be the coordinator of these projects around the world. So, and as mentioned previously, uh, we have 30 countries engaged in projects um, as, as of today, and several of those uh, global grants are now under underway. The other major concern that I've had over the decades, the last two in particular, is with our action of collecting uh, important data. And so we've had a project called Project Impact Reporting, and that's been led by Mina Venkatra Raman and May O'Brien and a team of five others. We've been working to expand the pilot project, Project Impact Reporting, and uh, with its uh, app, iRotary, to collect data across Rotary projects. We have got, begun this documentation at a granular le level across the environment and climate projects. And Mina has been really crucial in all of this. And it's my pleasure now to pass the mic over to her. Mina, the mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. And thank you, Chris. Uh, so both Chris and Salvador have already talked to you about what are the nature-based solutions that are being uh, talked about at the COP28. Uh, I will be leading a session called Land Use where we will be talking about how biodiversity and climate change work on uh, uh, you know, land use and how uh, indigenous communities, which were stewards of our biodiversity, are now uh, groping with what they are, with the loss of biodiversity, loss of their income. So I'm just going to share a, a few slides with you to also show you what Rotary has been doing, which is the goal of uh, the previous COPs and also of the biodiversity COP, or, or what is called as the COP15, which is the Cuming in Montreal Protocol. Let me just share my screen. And... So basically, there has been a 69% reduction of species. And this is, a, this is basically species abundance, not just a single species. And this is across from your algae to your tigers and elephants. And that's what would be talked about in Chris's session uh, with what is going on with extinction of species. But what we are looking at at the land use session is also what are the main causes for biodiversity loss? And the top one is actually invasive species that we don't see because for us, uh, this has been around for the past 50 and 100 years. And most of us think of them as part of our landscape. And right now for achieving the Paris uh, uh, goal of 30 by 30, where 30% 30 of uh, the world's uh, biomes are going to be protected, it's going to be very difficult with the kind of habitat loss we are having with invasive species. And the top way to do that is restoration of the habitat. And the second main thing that we lose sight of is that we all think of tropical forests as being our sinks for car carbon, but we forget about 
a part of the photosynthesis is that the leaves stop functioning when the air temperature increases. Actually, a seven degree Fahrenheit change in the canopy leads to the leaf fall, and what you have is a carbon sink turns into a carbon source. So I'm not going to go into great detail, but the main uh, uh, two uh, categories for biodiversity loss, uh, as shown in the past month, has been the loss to the coral reefs and loss to cycads, whom we most of us have seen in gardens somewhere. But also, uh, what's happening with our mountains, their unique biodiversity uh, loss, and that's where the headland waters are. And we've heard so many stories about floods happening all over the place. This slide that you are seeing is, shows you where the biodiversity index is the most intact. Those are all the black zones. What we are looking at are the yellow zones. And I'd like to share with you what Rotary is doing so far in terms of global grants that is actually, that can be seen that we are working on restoration. We have nine global grants going on in that. We have restoration projects in mangroves and coral reef. We are doing well here, but as Chris says, we do not, we work as Rotary clubs at local communities and we do not have that information. So at the COP, at the land use uh, 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 program, which is on the 10th uh, of uh, December, this is what we'll be talking about. Thank you. And I would like to pass the mic on to Felix, who will be talking about agriculture right now. Felix, the floor is yours. Felix doesn't seem to be as a panelist. Uh, he may have got he, maybe disconnected. No problem. We'll 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 promote him now from attendee to uh, to panelists. I, I don't see him in attendees either. Okay, so he might have already dropped from the call. In that case, sorry. Can you see if he wants to overtake? Okay, um, Chris, would you like to overtake the part from? Uh, Engineer Felix. Yes, yeah, so uh, the presentation that uh, Felix was going to give is to do with agriculture. And so this is a, a session that's going to uh, speak about how we work with climate smart agriculture, as you uh, refer to it in, in America, and um, regenerative agriculture in some places and various other terminology that re essentially relates to the replenishment of soils and getting soil health back uh, into uh, being healthy soils. And so there's programs associated, this program is associated with, with that and also with anything to do with uh, improving our agricultural production in the face of um, the intense pressure that's coming on from climate change. Climate change is actually forcing different areas to change their, their agricultural production. In some places, the world is becoming wetter. And so uh, crops that were supposed to be growing in drier climates are now being flooded because it's now wet. And uh, in other places, uh, the, the areas are becoming drier. And so now we have to change the crops to something that's uh, a drier crop. And so uh, what Felix is going to be presenting is particularly uh, actions that are happening across Africa and, uh, and particularly in Kenya. So uh, that's uh, a very brief uh, overview of what Felix, uh, Felix will be uh, giving us at uh, COP28. And then I'd like to hand the floor back to Ramsey and uh, there may be some questions. Actually, Felix is back on online. Oh, okay. I can see him now okay. part of the panelists. Felix, the floor is yours if you're able to get back on and your internet's working well. Okay, I can see that you're in the car. <laughs> All right. We will be, uh, we'll be sharing. Uh -huh. Can Maggie hit? Okay. 
Unfortunately, uh, Felix will not be able to share your presentation. Would you be uh, willing to take the floor to talk to us about your ag agricultural and innovation? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, I can just speak about it. You can hear me, right? We can hear you very well. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, I'm sorry I was traveling. I just got into the city. As soon as I got in, then there was a disconnection. Uh, but critical to the information and also to the conversation and presentation is the kind of regenerative agriculture that you're practicing, especially as Rotary. Um, I'm part of uh, District 9212, uh, and we have what you call the program of scale. Uh, and uh, so what happen what's happening is for the last 10 years, um, there are a couple of arid areas in the northern part of Kenya. One of them is called Turukana. Now, Turukana, they've uh, that region, they haven't received rain for the last, uh, let's say, two years. So instead of um, people always giving donations, there was a need for us to be able to now find a way we can be able to reconstruct the soil in such a way that we can, they can they, the community themselves, we can teach them how to be able to grow uh, crops. Uh, the main uh, livelihood for them is usually livestock, and this is uh, nomadism, pastoralism, which is not good for the environment. Um, so as part of that, uh, for the last 10 years, we've been able to achieve uh, or rather regain uh, the desertification that is uh, up in the north in Turkana. And uh, we are planning to be able to scale the same to three more counties because uh, it's been proven that uh, uh, teaching them how to grow, te te uh, pretty much teaching them how to be able to develop crops is far much cheaper, seven times cheaper than uh, always receiving donations when there are droughts. Uh, so this is uh, what uh, Rotary District 9212 is doing. And um, some of the systems and also technology that you're using is IoT systems. That is for soil monitoring. Uh, it's been proven that soil is the best uh, sequestrator of carbon. Uh, it can absorb up to um, 4,000 gigatons of CO2. Uh, and so what, what we did is um, through some of the Rotaracts of uh, whom I'll speak about and also showcase, uh, they were able to come up with IoT devices that help uh, in soil testing in 15 seconds. And on top of that, they were able to come up with a system of uh, creating biochar out of uh, the waste that is coming from the farms. And then they are able to use that to be able to rebuild the structure of the soil in such a way it can absorb more uh, of the CO2. Uh, and also some of the satellite systems, uh, some of the technology that is being used to be able to monitor the land and also monitor the CO2 are satellite systems. We've been working with Sentinel-2. Um, so this will be part of the conversation uh, on regenerative agriculture. And so we look forward to uh, as many as possible Rotarians just come and see what other Rotary members in Africa are doing uh, towards uh, enabling a climate-friendly uh, environment. So uh, let me stop over there. But um, I know we couldn't share the, um, the slides. And I'm sorry I was traveling. But I'm glad I was able to uh, log in and also kind of give a brief up on it. Uh, thank appreciate, you. Appreciate that and uh, hope you had safe travels and welcome back to your country. Um, for the time being, I'm going to be giving uh, the floor for a, a brief moment only for some, some questions to be asked. I'm asking my colleagues here just to review the questions that were asked in the Q&A. If you have any questions, please uh, do so quickly on the Q&A uh, section at the bottom. And uh, we'll just make sure that you mention, please, who is the panelist that you're going to be asking and uh, send your question as quickly as possible in order to be able to entertain that. Uh, Maggie, do you have any questions? Okay, great. So I will be asking my my colleague Maggie to uh, share the screen on the questions and answers, and to share the to to to, to read out the questions for uh, the answer to be provided. Thank you, Ramzi, um, and thanks to all the speakers that uh, really enriched our knowledge about the participation of Rotary International at COP twenty eight. We do have a couple of questions in the Q and A section. Um, I will start uh, a question that was related to President Yassin Jaffer. And it was related to um, how the companies are participating at COP28. Sorry, yes, I'm just uh, revising um, Point. Yeah, so it's mostly related how the private sector is participating at COP28. Are there any plans for the early companies to transition to providing renewable energy or transitioning? Perfect, yes. 
Are there any plans from UAE companies to transition to providing renewable energy or transitioning away from petroleum? President Yassin, we will be able to answer this question. Yes. Can I answer now? Please go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, there is a lot of initiative in the last uh, five to seven years in the private sector. Of course, the government is doing great. I will give three examples on the government. Uh, Dubai has built the largest solar uh, farm for electricity uh, production, and it is growing. Uh, a Japanese company called Morabini and the three local companies here in partnership to build this park. When it's finished, it will be the largest solar park in the world to produce electricity, number one. Number two, <clears throat> Dubai government, through the municipality department or the municipality house, a number of uh, uh, private sector, like the golf courses, like the shopping malls, like... Uh, or converting all their car parks uh, with the solar roof and taking the electricity, putting it in the uh, national grid. So that is number two. Number three, all the plastic companies is involved in a scheme with the government to collect the plastic. And there is six or seven companies now is converting the plastic into our in, uh, into uh, re, what you call uh, recycled cloth. Uh, that's number uh, example one on this. Example two is uh, the government has created a fund and it's called the sustainability fund. The fund will fund anything to recycle industrial water. We have a lot of factories and we have a lot of refineries. We have a lot of plants that produce water. We used to put the water back into the we, we used to take the water, put it in the sewage system. Now it is a, a, a rule that uh, you have to bring an industrial water filtration or intensive water, uh, if you like, treatment to plant, and you have to recycle the water, use 50, 60% back. The remaining one has to go into a different sewage and doesn't go through the normal sewage on that one. So. One of my companies is heavily involved into the water, industrial water treatment, and we could see how easy for companies to apply to the sustainable fund and they can use uh, that one. So uh, the answer is uh, there is a, a huge awareness in the private sector to participate with the government initiative on all the renewable, uh, on all the renewable uh, electricity or water or the, the plastic recycling. Uh, Thank you, President Yassin. I hope that answers your question. I will go to the next one. Um, well, unfortunately, we do not take uh, questions from anonymous attendees. So kindly name your uh, profile so we'll be able to answer accordingly and follow up with you if there is any other uh, information needed. I will continue with um, Alison Burroughs. Are you accepting proposals for lectures, workshops at the pavilion? The question is related to Christopher Putok. Chris, can you please unmute yourself? Yes, so we are, um, each of the program leaders uh, has the responsibility of, of uh, finding the best um, people in the world who will be at COP and and be able to present within their programs and so that is what is being done uh, so uh, we are not accepting any um, programs that are virtual we possibly could accept something that was recorded but it's up to each of our program leaders uh, across all the days of cop to um, invite somebody to speak in their program to, uh, that meets the concept of what that program is going to be about. So if you have somebody who is going to be a COP and uh, you would like them to speak in any of the particular thematic areas, please uh, contact the program leader. And you've probably heard from each of the program leaders today with the programs that they're associated with. Uh, most of the um, speakers 
uh, full, but I suspect that there are a few openings uh, that are still available. Thank you so much um, for your interest in, in that question. Um, I hope that uh, your uh, speaker that you're thinking about will be able to fit into the system. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We do have a question that is for Salvador. What are the waste materials which we can recycle? But I would like to encourage you to actually attend his session during COP28. Unless Salvador would like to briefly answer the question, um, Salvador, the floor is yours. I, I believe salvage means Salvador. So the, uh, it is a very vast uh, program on the Adopt the River program, obviously. The uh, materials that we want to um, recycle is everything, if possible. And uh, in particular, the global grants that have been done, for instance, in the River Nile, where they purchased a boat to collect all the plastic. Uh, the phase two, it is to uh, begin a processing uh, facility to make all the plastic that has been collected and build it, make it into building blocks uh, to build homes to make it a second life. So um, again, definitely encourage you to come over and join us at the presentations. And uh, all of those presentations will be available later on at the uh, ESRAC website. Thank you, Salvador. Uh, we do have other questions that are related to the volunteers at COP28, especially from the Rotaractors. If you are a rotor actor um, or a younger Rotarian who have applied, kindly note that your applications are under revision. And in the next two weeks, we'll be able to respond to you who are the 12 rotor actors who have been elected to be the official delegation volunteers uh, at COP28. Uh, we will um, analyze various factors, which is involvement in environmental projects, the passion as well in environmental causes, the availability of the participants and as well what are their endorsements from their district so these questions will be answered to you directly on your email that you have provided during the registration process um, i would uh, also like to open um, the attendees who have been asking uh, with raising hand so we only have Four as of now, so I kindly ask you to be very brief. Um, I will allow you to talk and to ask your question to the panelists. Please name the panelists first and then ask your question. Thank you. So we will go with Ahmad Jawad Mohammad. Uh, we will be able to ask to ask your question. Kindly unmute yourself. Um, Ahmad. You are not unmuted, so I will continue to the next uh, person that is raising their hand. Um, can you please name yourself and ask the panelists the question? Second. You are you are able to ask your question. However, if you do not, I will continue to the next uh, one. Um, Dr. Sam Hancock from Rotary District 7620. Yes, am I coming through? Yes, please okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. This is Dr. Uh, Kalik. Uh, thank you for sharing about your renaissance of smart energy. And uh, and what out, out of your research of your book and best practices do you suggest including smart energy with some of the more advanced, uh, no hazardous waste discharges, wastewater systems, while producing pure drinking water available for all local communities, regardless of their sizes or locations or types of water, like surface, brackish, uh, sea or black water. And I think the uh, president was just sharing about that for Dubai recently, but how would you combine these two together and uh, both the energy and these uh, new, more advanced technologies uh, for using renewable energy and producing pure drinking water. And thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Dr. Sam. It's an amazing question, actually. Uh, I didn't expect that that's kind of intense question. So uh, I would be very happy to sign my book if you can come and uh, we can meet in person at COP28. And I would be very happy 
uh, to answer your uh, question uh, with broad perspective, uh, if you can share if, uh, your email, I can kindly ask your email. Uh, in that regard, clean energy uh, needs, uh, actually, uh, just briefly, I want to say that uh, carbon capture and carbon storage technologies, that's also uh, Dr. Yasin Jeffer, he highlighted. So I will be very happy to share some uh, research. My, my research was mainly focusing on uh, German energy and the energy transition uh, project, Europe project. So I will be very happy to share some information in that regard with you uh, uh, via your email. We can exchange our details. Thank you so much. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for everyone. Um, for the other questions that are mentioned in the chat, we can see that they have been most of them answered. Um, please note that if you have another question, you can always email us at cop28 at rotary.ae email. And if we our time allows and our panelists are able to answer that, we will be answering you. I will leave this to the moderator, Ramzi Nassar. Well, thank you everyone for thank you everyone for your questions, first of all, and thank you for the panelists for taking the time to answer these questions. I really thank everyone for attending this session. And as we conclude this informative webinar, I want to extend my sincere appreciation to our distinguished speakers, esteemed panelists, and our attentive audience. Your active engagement has truly enriched today's discussion with our sights set on the horizon. Let's look forward to COP28, set to take place at the magnificent Expo City site in Dubai from November 30th to December 12th, 2023. This global gathering of leaders and experts promises to be a defining moment in our ongoing efforts to address pressing climate challenges. Here is a fascinating glimpse into what awaits. COP28 will host more than 80,000 delegates, including 140 heads of state and government who will be contemplating and taking decisions on important environmental issues. Let's channel our collective enthusiasm and commitment towards making COP28 an outstanding success. Thank you for your participation today, and let's continue working together for a sustainable future. We, er we eagerly await and anticipate your presence at COP28. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight, and have a great night from the UAE, uh, and hopefully a great day anywhere else where it's still daytime. Also over here, you can visit our Rotary website where you can go and check out more information about COP28. And you can also follow us on Rotary COP28 on, on Instagram, where we'll be sharing additional information about what's happening and a lot of media content in order to keep uh, updated and to keep the anticipation up. We hopefully see you soon in November. Thank you. <laughs>